Okay, this is a short network on the different network media. Well, it's a short lecture, not a short network. I was looking at the word network. Different uh, short le lecture on the different network media that you can choose, and we're talking specifically about bounded media. So the learning targets for this lecture are going to be that you understand the three main cable lot types, what their characteristics are, when to use what kind of cables, and when some are better in different situations and why. So we have three main types of cable. We have coaxial cable, twisted pair cable, and fiber optic cable. All have their pluses and their minuses. So let's start with coaxial cable. Um, coaxial cable, mainly now, we actually see in um, used in um, cable modems and things like that. So it's mainly used in wide area technology um, uses, but it used to be used in bus networks. And so this is what a coaxial cable looks like. You can see that on the outside it's got the insulation. Um, and the insulation is generally PVC pipe. Uh, the inside is a Kevlar ground. It's usually a woven uh, Kevlar shield, not like bulletproof Kevlar, but Kevlar. And then we've got the insulation on the inside. So it's a highly insulated type of cable. And then it's got a solid co uh, copper um, core um, for the main wire. One of the best things about coaxial cable is that coaxial cable is highly resistant to EMI. It's really pretty easy to install. Um, it's very simple to crimp. If you're gonna if you're gonna create a coaxial cable, you take what's called a BNC connector. BNC is the name of the connectors, and you just stick it on this little area over here, and um, you take a, a coaxial crimper. Um, or to be honest, you can actually just take a pair of uh, needle nose pliers and smash, 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 and it's all good. Siri, stop eavesdropping. Siri's eavesdropping on me. Um, so it's it's easy to install. Um, it's got uh, it attenuates out at about 500 um, meters, so it's got a long range. Uh, the only thing is, is that um, the bandwidth capacity isn't high, so it's not really used as much anymore. Um, it does have a high. Uh, well, I mean, it's. It's not used in local area networks. You can see it's thick. So we've got two different kinds. Um, it is, in fact, you can see how thick it is. It's called thick net. One of the kinds is called thick net. We've got two different kinds. We've got thick net and we've got thin net. And thick net was generally used as backbones and thin net was used like in the local area network. Um, but it's a, it's a beefy cable. I mean, you could do some damage with it if you wanted to, to beat somebody with it. Not that I'm suggesting that, mind you. So let's take a look at ThickNet. Uh, this is old ThickNet. You, you know, this is not something that you would use now because you can see this is like an old connector here. Um, rarely used, uh, but still in the 801 certification. So talking about it now. Uh, uses a drop cable and vampire trap to connect to the backbone. Um, and um, yeah, so a backbone is just, it's, in a bus network, so you have a bus network, and a bus network is a cable, thick. Don't I draw nice, pretty lines? You know, I could just use a thicker line tool, couldn't I? But I'm committed. I'm committed, so I'm going with this. Let's say that's a backbone. And then off the backbone, you would have... Um, uh, what you would have is you would have drop cables that would come off the backbone. on a bus network to connect the nodes. And so this here is the backbone. Um, and the backbone is what where like the main, it's usually the fastest part of the network and so it's got the highest capacity. Um, and it's, it's where everything else connects to. So thin it is kind of what we know as coaxial. It looks like our, um, you know, what, you, what cable TV comes over. Um, also known as RG58. 
Um, it's really easy to install because you can see it. You just it has the screw on heads, which or or the um, you just kind of stick them in and then turn them to the left to clockwise uh, to engage and then counterclockwise to disengage. Um, it's also known as ten base two. Um, ten base two it means that it runs at ten megabits per second. It is a um, baseband uh, network, and it is uh, can run at about 200 meters before it attenuates out, or about 185 meters. Um, pretty cheap, uh, 2.5 um, megabits per second if you're using an ArcNet installation. Uh, ArcNet is uh, pretty obsolete, but that was the old thing. 10 megabits per, per second uh, potential. That means that's as fast as it can go with Ethernet. And then EMI super shielded as, you know, because we, we have the insulation here and we have insulation on the PVC coating. So we've got two layers of insulation. So that means that electromagnetic interference um, just kind of, you know, is going to bounce right off of it. And it's not going to be very susceptible to it. The connectors are called BNCT and BNCT, BNC barrel connectors, and then it can be eavesdropped in by being on by being tapped into, but it has to be physically tapped into. Um, and so, uh, the other thing is that with a ten base two network, the maximum number of nodes that you can connect in a segment is thirty. Thirty nodes, thirty nodes max per segment. After that, you get too many collision, and why am I not writing with my pencil? Why am I writing with my finger? A finger does not do the job. I have a pencil for this. And then um, you also have to follow the th the um, five four three rule on this network. The five four three rule states that you have five segments. And those segments are separated by four repeaters or hubs. But only three of them can have nodes. So you have to keep two segments clear. And the purpose of that is to reduce collisions. Um, you only have to have the 543 rule in Ethernet. You don't have to have it in any other kind of network. Um, and you only have, really have to have it in this kind of an Ethernet network. The other thing in a bus network, which we'll talk about more also, when we talk about topologies, is we have to have terminators on both ends of our bus network, and we have to have grounding on one end of a bus network. And the reason we have to have that is that when you're running a network with such high um, voltage, now we're not talking high voltage like, you know, stick a finger in the light socket and, you know, blow yourself off voltage, but still this is a pretty thick core that we're talking about here. And so we do need to have it grounded and um, then we also need to be, deal with signal bounce back. Um, if you don't terminate, um, what will happen is you're going to get signal bounce back. So let's say you got a cable here and you got your signal, and the signal goes in both directions, right? On your cable. Well, if this is the end of the line, and you got your nodes that come off your cable, um, if it's the end of the line, and you're not terminated at both ends, you don't have a terminator, Termination. What the termination does is it actually absorbs the extra electrons. Well, if you don't have any termination, then what happens is it's kind of like what happens when you reach a dead end street. You have to turn around, right? So if let's say if there's a bunch of traffic on a road, but there's no sign that says there's a dead end and all that traffic goes driving down that road, the traffic has to turn around, right? And when the traffic turns around, it collides with the with the traffic going that way. So if all the traffic is going north, but then it all has to turn around, then it turns around to go south, you get bounce back. And so this poor node here is not going to get very good communication. So termination
reduces bounce back. Look at the mess my screen is. And so you got to terminate on both ends and then ground on one end. On one end. Okay? So here's a picture of the BNC connectors. This is a barrel connector. And this barrel connector connects either directly here um, or it's going to actually connect right here. So this guy connects here and then another cable would connect there. This is a terminator and the terminators are 50 ohms that means that they can they have 50 ohms of resistance so what happens is basically they just absorb 50 ohms of um, energy and they don't allow that to bounce back so it's basically the electrons have some place to go hang out you know rather than bouncing back so cable cable uh, if there's no um, node over here, then it would go cable terminator. Easy peasy. Fire codes, super important with Ethernet cable. Now, you have yourself a ceiling. And in the ceiling, let's say this is a building. Side view. Windows. Windows. You can draw a cable or pull a cable through walls. You can pull cables through ceilings. You can pull cables through subflooring. If you are going to pull cable through a ceiling, because you have what's called a plenum, this is the plenum, you must follow fire codes. And fire codes state that if you pull cabling through the plenum, you must use plenum rated cabling. Why must you use plenum radium cabling? Because PVC, polyvinyl chloride, gives off a poisonous gas when it is heated or burned. The plenum does not have a whole lot of oxygen going on up there. And so when a fire gets started in the plenum, it's not going to be a big, you know, hair on fire, um, Michael Bay explosion type fire. It's going to be just a little smolder fire. And a smolder fire can actually burn for days. And in the meantime, what happens? What else do you have up there? You have your HVAC. Don't ask me why my H is so fat. And so you can have a little smolder fire going on up there for days and giving off and people will kind of maybe smell sort of a plastic burning smell. And while they're going <laughs> Plastic burning smell. I smell a plastic burning smell. Oh well, life as usual. What they're doing is they're they're actually breathing in poisonous gases, and it's not like they're all gonna like drop dead on the spot. But PVC poisonous gas actually causes cancer, and you know, ten years down the road, you've given everybody in the office cancer. So um, generally, not a good thing. They tend to frown on giving people cancer as a part of your services. So since that's not written into your contract that you're going to give your clients cancer, it's probably a good idea to follow the fire codes. And the fire code says we cannot put PVC in the plenum. No PVC in the plenum. So we have to use plenum rated cabling because if you don't use plenum rated cabling, then um, you can get huge fines. So we never put, put regular cabling go into the drop thing. The other thing that we have to be careful of in the drop ceiling is that you also have um, uh, lights up here. And fluorescent lights give off a lot of noise. EMI is high up here because of fluorescent lights. And so we want to make sure that our cabling is pretty well shielded if we're going to put it up in the ceiling. And so you can shield it through a conduit or you can use shielded twisted pair cabling if you're using unshielded twisted, if you're using twisted pair cabling. Or, you know, you can go ahead and use coaxial um, if uh, speed isn't an issue.
So now let's look at twisted pair. We've got shielded twisted pair. We've got unshielded twisted pair. When do you use what? Well, you can use a combination in a network, and that's what's pretty nice. So let's take a look at both. Unshielded twisted pair is the most common um, cabling that we use in networks right now. It's got copper cores, um, eight wires uh, surrounded by a PVC coating or a plenum rated coating. Um, usually when you choose it, it's the cost is going to be the main thing. Its cost is the lowest unshielded twisted pair. So if resistance to EMI is not important, we are going to always use um, unshielded twisted pair. Um, both of the wires have um, four pairs of twists um, and or four twisted pairs going through them. They both install relatively easy. They both use RJ45 heads. Uh, speed is similar. Um, uh, UTP is always going to be a little cheaper because it doesn't have that extra shielding on it. Um, but for the most part, you're almost always going to go with shielded, unshielded twisted pair. The range is the same on 100 meters. Um, really important to remember that. And it is a potential of 100 meters. You're not always going to get 100 meters out of it. So you're not, you, you know, you can't just pace out 100 meters and call it good. And you have to remember that that's 100 meters from the switch. You, it's not 100 meters of cable. It's 100 meters max. Uh, unshield twisted pair, um, there's no coating. The, it, it, or it does have a little bit of protective coating because you've got the PVC on the outside and then each of the copper cabling obviously has some a little bit of PVC on it. Um, and then shielded twisted pair actually has the copper cable, uh, the, the PVC on the outside, it has a little bit of cabling, and then there is a shield throughout the um, one on the inside, and I'll show you a little picture on the outside. So when do you use what? Well, because shielded twisted pair is less sensitive to UTP, when you have a noisy environment, you're gonna wanna run, if you're running twisted pair cabling, you're gonna wanna run shielded twisted pair through your noisy environment. Now, if you have a super noisy environment, speed is not as important. You can go with unshield, or you can go with coaxial. It's just that you're going to need a media converter to do that. So in that case, you're going to have a shielded twisted pair or two-inch shielded twisted pair. But honestly, what you would more likely go with in this day and age is fiber to twisted pair to shield to unshielded twisted pair, or shielded twisted pair to unshielded twisted pair. Very rarely are we even really going to use coaxial anymore. In fact, I think on the next certification, we're probably not even going to be looking at coaxial. I'm going to have to look at it. I'm probably going to have to re-record this next year. Doggone it. So when are you going to use unshielded twisted pair? Almost every time. When are you going to use shielded twisted pair? When EMI is an issue. So let's say you're in a, a noisy machine shop. Um, where there's motors, because motors give off a lot of EMI. So you have to know what gives off EMI. Microwaves, motors, uh, lights, uh, fluorescent ones especially. I um, was taking a class one time with a, with a teacher, and she was not great. Um, it was a summer class, and it was out of Bellevue College. So it was not a teacher for Bellevue College. I think Bellevue College has some awesome teachers, but she was like, she was teaching a night class, she was teaching a day class, and um, during the day class, everything ran fine. She set up a, a, a temporary network, but the night class, she couldn't figure out why the network was so slow, and it was so intermittent and cranky, and she just couldn't figure it out, she just couldn't figure it out, and she finally like decided that she was going to, over the weekend, come in and just figure it, just suss it out, you know, like, what is going on with this stupid network? It works great during the day, it doesn't work great at night, I don't get it. And the room had lots of windows in it, and so she had a friend come in, and he was going to help her, and he also worked in networking. And she irritated me so much in the class, because she would say things that weren't true, and I was taking the class because I was required in order to teach the Microsoft um, content, um, 
to have these classes under my belt, but I've been teaching this stuff already for a long time, plus I've been running my own server, plus I've been tech support for a long time. So it was sort of just a hoop that I had to jump through. And so she would say things that I knew weren't true, and I'd be like, oh, excuse me, actually, if you do that, then you will lose it. So, for example, she had, like, one time said, you could convert a disk from FAT to NTFS without losing data, and you could convert a disk from NTFS to FAT without losing data. Well, you can convert a disk from FAT to NTFS without losing data. We did that as a lab. But you can't convert a disk from NTFS to FAT without losing data. You have to reformat it. You can't, because there's no command to do that. It is a completely different file allocation table. It uses a vector table instead of a file allocation table. And it just doesn't work that way. Um, and so I'm like, mm, you know what, you can't do that. Anyways, so it just got to the point where I was like, I guess I'm just not explaining anymore what you can't do. So what it was was that in, during the day, she, it wasn't her that actually figured it out, it was this other guy that did. She wasn't using the lights, and she had thrown the wiring, she'd thrown over UTP cables over the top of the hanging um, fluorescent lights. And so at night, when she turned on the lights, what was happening? Bingo! You know what, I wish I was like one of those really good artists, but I'm not. The lights were turning on. The network was turning off because fluorescent lights give off all of this electromagnetic interference. So you can't, you got to be careful. You have to make sure you have shielded cabling or some sort of a shielded conduit that your stuff is going through. A conduit just means something that you put it through, you know, like a tube of some type. Um, I mean, you usually use cable trays uh, or, or some sort of a, something like that. But you can put, do a shielded con uh, uh Concrete boxes is what they're called. Um, duct spacers, that sort of thing. Um, and, yeah, and I just thought, really? You know, you're supposed to be teaching us this stuff and you don't know that? I mean, that is a basic, <laughs> basic thing. The problem was, all she knew was what she was learning from the PowerPoints in um, Microsoft. So you can become a Microsoft trainer just by knowing the PowerPoints and passing the certifications, which you could do by going to the boot camp classes. And I just, I, it irritated me. Um, anyhow, so when am I going to use STP? EMI? Um, when am I going to use UTP? Most of the time. So here's some other connectors that you might see used. IBM connectors, these babies are old. That's this guy. And they would be in a coaxial cable. No, well, is it a coaxial? Yeah, mm. they're old. This is an old IBM data connector. It kind of looks, you can see sort of like a um, serial port, sort of like a VGA port, but it's not. It's just an old DB9. And that would be thin net, and it would be that drop cable that would go to the network card. This is what we see most often. This is RJ45. Hi, RJ45. RJ just stands for registered jack. My name is Jack, and I am registered as number 45. And this is RJ11. Not H, 11. Um, and what's that? POTS. And what does POTS stand for? Plain Old Telephone Service. Uh, one of my favorite acronyms, I love acronyms that are very simple and to the point, Plain Old telep Telephone Service. Um, so we've got our Ethernet cable right here. We've got our telephone cable right here. Actually could also be considered an Ethernet cable because you can run Ethernet cable through two, pa uh, two um, pair systems. Um, and RJ11 is a two pair system. Two pair which is um, uh, CAT2, I want to say, um, uh, DB9, and how can you tell it's DB9? There's nine little holes there, and IBM. 
So here's what a twisted pair, uh, unshielded twisted pair looks like. You've been probably looking at these enough in class to know them by heart now. You've got your orange pair, your green pair, your blue pair, and your brown pair. Uh, an orange white and an orange, a green white and a green, a blue white and a blue, and a red light and a red. The purpose of the twist, why twist? Because when you have two wires that run, uh, when you have a wire, what happens is the electrons go through it, they travel through it, what they do is they create an electromagnetic kind of uh, orbit around it. And then if you take and you have another wire that goes right next to it and the electrons go through it and it goes straight next to it, it gets this sort of electromagnetic orbit around it and they interfere and that causes crosstalk. Well, if I twist these, then what happens is those two orbits, I have to draw this very carefully, but now suddenly they work together and there's no more interference. Isn't that cool? That's so sciencey. I love it. So that's what those twists do. And the more twists you have, the better those work together, that electromagnetic um, cycle works together. And so this noise that's created, what all this is, is this extra stuff, is noise. This noise, this induced noise cycle is actually canceled out through these twists. It is the coolest, one of the coolest scientific things ever. I think that it, it, science and engineering is just so amazing in, um, in our, in, in networking. So with shielded twisted pair, the way it works is actually number one, there's going to be more twists. You see that there's different colored um, pairs, but that doesn't really matter. It, it's exactly the same stuff. It's still going to be the same core. And then we have, um, uh, we have shielding, extra shielding. And usually this is a little thicker as well. Um, it's, it's, just a, it's just such an elegant way to deal with um, that, that problem of the noise that is created as electrons move through a wire. It's such, uh, it's such an elegant, just simple way to deal with it. They didn't have to introduce any outside things. They just simply said, okay, this is what happens. Magnetic interference is created as electrons move through a system because why? Friction um, and electrons bouncing off of each other. Well, that magnetic interference can be reduced by having the two wires be moved together, uh, twisted together, ta-da, fixed, love it. So here's what you're going to write down. Why twist? Copper cabling, very susceptible to EMI. Uh, twisting reduces the crosstalk. Crosstalk, the more the less, the more resistant to EMI. So there are different categories of unshielded twisted pair, um, and we use different categories for different things. Right now, uh, the most commonly used is Cat5e. Uh, Cat6 is becoming very ubiquitous. M ubiquitous meaning used throughout, very common. Um, so what we are going to look at is what is going to be the best solution when you choose a cabling, what is going to be the best solution now, and what's going to be the best solution in the future. You don't want to only say, what's going to be the best solution now, what's going to cost the less, what's going to meet my needs. Because you have to have, you have to future-proof your network. You can't just say, oh, this is good enough for now. I'll worry about what I need tomorrow, tomorrow. Um, because it's very expensive to upgrade everything. And so it's better to spend a little bit more money now so you have to spend less money later. Um, and in the case of cabling, it, makes, it doesn't make sense to be on the bleeding edge of technology. You know, the bleeding edge of technology means being a, in a situation where you are... Um, actually going and getting the newest thing all the time. I, you know, I tend to be one of those bleeding edge of technology kind of people. 
Um, but being on the bleeding edge of technology means, or being on the cutting edge of technology means getting it like maybe second generation or um, second iteration of the first generation, meaning after it's had a few updates and people have tested it and they know that it's working and it's, and it's working well. So category one um, was plain old telephone system. Ah, I was wrong on that other slide. It's category one. Um, or an ISDN, which is a cut type of a telephone system. Category two runs at four megahertz. It's IBM token ring. Um, category three is 10 base T. Remember that the 10 stands for the speed. So 10 megabits per second. Uh, the the um, base stands for baseband, and T stands for twisted pair. Um, or it can be 100 base T. That would be 100 megabits per second, baseband, twisted base, twisted um, pair. Uh, category 4 is 20 megahertz, 10 base T, 100 base T, 4. That would mean T, four, t 4 twists. So cat 4 looks very similar to cat 5. Uh, it just has less twists, so it doesn't run quite as fast. Cat 5 can go up to 100 uh, megabits per second. It's, it's just a little more stable than cat 4 and more ubiquitous. Cat5 is what we see almost everywhere. Cat5e actually had more twists and it had improved attenuation and it actually went up to gigabits, gigabit. And then Cat6, um, way improved attenuation, uh, can go up to gigabit, runs at 250 megahertz, much wider bandwidth, much faster. Cat6, um, oh I'm sorry, Cat6 was 250 megahertz. Um, and it went up to, it actually, Cat6 is also way less, way more resistant to EMI because of more twists and it's resistant to outside EMI. Um, it's also Cat5 on, it's considered fast Ethernet because it could go um, up to a gig. Uh, Cat6 and Cat5e, Cat6, Cat7, those can all also use fiber optic cable. And so they, you may see um, Cat6 and Cat7, you may see G-Base, um, or you may, or not, you might see um, 100 base. If you see G-Base, then that would mean gigabit. If you see TX, that can stand for um, using, it, it referring to varied cabling. So it, mean, it can mean, it could be copper, it could be fiber. Um, if you see FL, that would mean fiber, um, that kind of thing. So these you do got to kind of know, so make sure you fill in this table on your notes. Make sure you fill it in. And know, N-O-W, know these things for the test. Because why is it important to know? Well, when you go to do your cable plants, and a cable plant is just what are you choosing for a cable? Um, for a building. So somebody would hire you if you were going to be a cabling expert and you were going to be a cable puller. You, they would hire you, your company, to lay out the cabling for a building. And that would include what kind of cable are you going to use? How is it going to be um, pulled through the building? Is it going to go through the walls? Is there a subfloor? Is it going to go through that? What kind of conduits are you going to use? Are you going to use cable trays? Are you going to use um, thing, uh, trays under the floor? Are you going to pull it through the plenum? Are you going to run it through the outside? What is going to be the WAN connection, the wide area connection? Are you going to use fiber optic? Or are you going to use, you know, depending on what's coming up. I mean, he, around here you can use cable modems uh, or you can use fiber optic business. Uh, and then what's going to pull it through? Um, and then once you get it installed, how many jacks are you going to have? Where are those jacks going to be located? What's the speed going to be? Um, are you going to run telephone through your cabling? Because you have four pairs, but network cabling only requires two of those pairs. So you can run your telephone lines through the other two pair. So you have a lot of choices to make, and this table helps you make those choices and decide which kind of cabling you're going to use. And when we're, when we're, always, when we're deciding our cabling, which you're going to do in your cable media assignment, this, this table actually helps you to know what kind of cabling to choose and future-proof your cabling. 
Category 8. Category 8 is awesome. Category 8 is really cool. It's got different kind of plugs. You can see. Look at how fancy they are. And they're all backwards compatible. So in a Category 8 cable, you can see that it looks very similar, it, but it's not an RJ45 jack. It's called um, ARJ45. And um, the ARJ45 plug is backwards compatible. So you, if you take a look at the RJ, ARJ45 plug, you can see that it's got these extra wires on the side. So this is a regular RJ45 plug here, this guy here, and this is an ARJ45. This is the requirements for an ARJ45 plug, or uh, you know, the regular one. This is the one that contains a backward compatible one with a switch. So it actually has a little switch built in. Isn't that funky? So that what that little switch does is that little switch actually recognizes whether or not the plug you've plugged in is a category five cable or six cable or seven cable or a category eight cable and then it accommodates it. And it will switch the um, sending and receiving pins according to the kind of cable you plugged in. So the nice thing about category eight is if you decide as a company to move into a category eight network, you don't have to worry about upgrading all at once. You can upgrade incrementally, which makes it a much more reasonable way to go. In the past, it made it a little more difficult. Now, not as much because actually Cat6 cabling, um, everything was pretty much, you know, you could upgrade a little bit at a time. But, you know, it would be kind of like going from super highway to dirt roads in your network, and that was kind of a problem. And you'll still get a little bit of that with Cat 8 Cable too, but um, it's pretty funky. Uh, the specs of Cat 8 Cable, speed, 1200 megahertz. It's twisted pair, but um, It's 40 G base T, which means it's 40 gigabits per second, baseband, twisted pair, through copper, so that is super fast. It's class 2 cabling, which that's cool because it allows for three different kinds of connectors, and they can all be used interchangeably, so it can use the RJ45, it can use the ARJ45, or it can use that combination one. And it's super fast. It's actually out there, but it really hasn't been um, it actually hasn't been adopted very, very widely because the standards have just, just, just been released. I would, I mean, today is 325, 2016, and I was just looking for it. So um, there's not a whole lot, ton of information out there except for a lot of, a lot of, um, um, uh, like, just standard setting. But it's coming. Fiber optic, most ideal material currently available for data transmission. The problem with fiber optic is it is expensive. There's no EMI problems at all. Why not? It's not electric. It's lights. Can't interfere with light with electricity. So that's one of the biggest benefits of fiber optic. You can run up to several kilometers without it attenuating because light can travel forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Well, not really forever and ever and ever, but it can travel for a really long ways. Um, the cost of fiber optic, it's really the highest cost of any cable. Um, installation, expensive and difficult. You usually do have to get a special certification to install fiber optic. It can be very dangerous to install on your own because if you're installing glass fiber, uh, which is the best and highest quality, you, you know, it's, it's um, actually uh, very difficult to install. If you break it off, you can hurt yourself. Um, attenuation. Like I said, kilometers of potential. Bandwidth, 100 megabits per second to 200,000 megabits per second. So it's got tons of bandwidth. EMI, completely insensitive to EMI. You can't eavesdrop on it because if you tap into it, you break it. So it's not like with another cable that you could maybe slice into it and, and pull out some stuff. Um,
just like shielded twisted pair and unshielded twisted pair have fiber architectures, so that's what Cat 2, Cat 3, Cat 4, Cat 5, those are considered architectures. Just the statistics of what the cabling can handle and how they are built and all that stuff. That's what an architecture is. Fiber optic. And fiber optic architecture is based on whether it is single mode fiber or multi mode fiber, and then how far it can go and um, whether or not it. Um, and yeah, and basically, and whether it's baseband or broadband. So we've got 10 G base ER, and so it, it's going to use a nice um, single mode fiber, and it's uh, usually used as a backbone. You see that it can go 40 kilometers. So in this case, it would be going in a straight line, and if it's using a nice clear glass um, cable, it will uh, actually probably be a municipality solution. So it'd be something that would be owned by a city, so a, mul a, a metropolitan area network possibly. It'd probably be between cities. So this would be a wide area network, right? And then it is going to be, of course, baseband. And what's it, the speed? because it's 10 GB. So 10 G base SR is multi-mode fiber. And this would probably be more of a local area network type of a deal. Although it could be a wide area network within a campus area network maybe, but most likely a local area network because look, we're only going 300 meters. But that's still quite a bit. That's three times as far as unshielded twisted pair. And it also is going quite a bit faster than unshielded twisted pair, although the same speed as um, Cat 7 and Cat 6. So, you know, it's more expensive. The um, equipment is more expensive and it's not backwards compatible by any stretch of the imagination with any of the copper stuff. You have to have media um, converters. So if you want to combine um, uh, RJ45 and um, fiber, you have to have a media converter. It, without a media converter, obviously you can't plug light into electric, um, or, you know, it is electric, super low voltage. Um, and you can't pl plug electric into light. So you have a, what's called a media converter, and um, that will turn your fiber optic into, um, digital pulses and then your digital into optical pulses. So um, this one here, again, 10 G base. So these are all 10 um, gigabit gig and then baseband. And then this is LR and it's again a single mode and it can go 10 kilometers. So you've got a lot of options here for um, nice Lots of bandwidth, 10 gigabits per second. 10 gigabits per second is nothing to sneeze at. You've got the options for lots of um, um, uh, capacity. And also, you're going quite a bit before you attenuate out. So you're just going to need to remember the names of these, SR, ER, and LR. Just remember ER plus LR equals um, when, and then uh, they're also both single mode. And then the other one is um, SR is, is uh, multi-mode and is probably the most, most likely going to be a local area network. So do you guys know this stuff? Well. Yeah, you're going to need to know it for your certification. If you're doing a cable plant, which is the plans for a network, of course you'd need to know it then. Uh, is it going to change? Of course it's going to change. Uh, it, it's, it's just the architecture is a fiber. Is it the most exciting thing in the world? No, it's not. Um, memorizing architectures is just one of those things, necessary evils that you have to do if you want to pass your certification. 
Do you have to memorize it now? It will be on the test, so you should probably know it for the test, but is it important that it stay in brain real estate? No, you can always re-memorize it when you go take your certification. But um, it is good to understand that there are different architectures that are used, and um, you'd be amazed at some of the things that we will not know, be able to talk about. Okay, so fiber optic cable it looks kind of like this, so this would be um, a single mode fiber. You've got your cladding in the middle, and cladding is sort of like a um, fiberglass, like a nylon type of a thing, and it's, it's kind of an insulator, and it surrounds the, ca the core. The core is in here, and the core is not orange or anything, or blue, it shows blue and orange. It's actually got some s sort of a sticky covering that you actually remove with a white an alcohol wipe type of a thing, something that looks like an alcohol wipe. And that covering is actually there to stabilize the core so that it doesn't crack or get crushed. Um, you do have to take care when dealing with fiber optic because it is glass, and glass, of course, breaks relatively easily. More likely, you would work in a local area network with a silica because silica is less expensive and it doesn't break as easily. But it does also is not nearly as pure and clear, and if it's not as pure and clear, you're not going to get the speed out of it. You're going to have more transmission problems. But um, that's what it looks like. And then, of course, you've got the sheath and the fiber core, which is either made of glass or... Um, silica. Uh, building or terminating fiber is a pain in the behind. You can't cut it because if you cut it, it cracks. Cut glass shatters. You cannot just cut glass. Um, and so you, what we used when we did it was a diamond tip chisel. And it was not like a big, beefy chisel. It was a teeny, tiny, 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 tiny chisel. And you chisel away at the very tip of this thing. And imagine if you took somebody's hair and you had to cut their hair, one single strand of it with a diamond tip chisel. And then, um, so you cut off the end. You, you sheath it back. You cut off the end with this diamond tip chisel. And then you put it into a little thing. That looks like a spirograph, and if you don't know what a spirograph is, you can Google it. If you do know what a spirograph is, awesome. I used to play with them as a kid. It made me feel artistic, which you can tell by my um, drawings on here that um, I am uh, to art as flies are to um, circus elephants. Wait a minute, flies and circus elements, elephants have a symbiotic relationship and I do not have a symbiotic relationship to art. At any rate, Tori, not an artist. So, um, you would use that with three different grades of very, very, very fine sandpaper. And then when you were all done, you would test it. And yes, guess what? Most of the time, um, when you first start, you crack it because you're so careful on the one end about um, with that diamond tip chisel. And then on the other end, you get a little cocky because you did it right the first time. And you, and you just have the tiniest of tiny cracks. And you can't actually see them until after you've gone through the buffing. The buffing takes forever. Um, like it's a, it's a very long process. I can't remember how many times you buff it, but it's, it's over a hundred times when the way I was taught to do it. And then you get the, the next finer sandpaper. So you have three different sandpapers and you buff it using this little spirograph thing so that it goes into this figure eight. And then you do it, do the next one over a hundred times. And then you do the next one over a hundred times. And then you stick it into the end of what looks like a kaleidoscope it has a light and it shines the light through the fiber optic cable but it's got a filter on it so that you can't look at the end of a fiber optic cable because the light in it is a laser light it's a light emitting diode and if you look in the end of it you will burn your retina so this has a filter in it you look in it and if it looks like a perfect circle then you know you did it right and you get all cocky and you feel really good about yourself um, but if it looks like anything but a circle or if it has a line through it it means you cracked or shattered your fiber optic core 
So then you have to go back and you have to start over again. And it really sucks because it takes so long, number one. And number two, the fiber optic heads are super, super expensive. I get the RJ45 heads sometimes for less than, I don't know, I get a hundred of them. Sometimes I can find a hundred of them for seven, eight dollars. So they're super cheap. So let's go ahead and review. Pretend you don't see that. So which is the most expensive cabling? <gasps> oh, look, there's the answer. Fiber optic. And which is the most susceptible to crosstalk? Unshielded twisted pair. And which is the hardest to install? Fiber optic. What is the maximum length of UTP Cat5 cable? 100 meters or approximately 300 feet. And what cable works with British Naval Connectors? Or I guess it would be British Naval Connectors Connectors. Coaxial. What is the insulation around a fiber core called? Cladding. What type of band usage allows multiple signals over one channel? Body band. And what type of band usage allows only one signal? Base band.
Pat. Okay, so what is often the most important consideration when you are making the decision about what cable to install in a new network? The number one one. Cost. So what are the other five? Now you gotta remember these, you have to memorize them. So I'm gonna give you a hint. Here's the letters they start with. C I R E T. C so come up with a new mnemonic or something like that. I made up one. Crazy Carl is really Easter T Rex. Don't ask. I saw somebody posted an Easter T Rex video on their Facebook. It was cute. So, what are the other characteristics? Capacity. Installation requirements, range, EMI or resistance to EMI, and finally, type of band. Is it baseband or is it broadband? So, last one. What kind of connectors do UTP cables use? RJ45, Oop. and what are the speed specifications for UTP cable? It can go 100 to 100,000 megabits per second, although right now, really, we're only going about 10,000 10, 10, megabits per second. Finally, which UTP category cable is most commonly used right now? Cat 5e or Cat 6. And